It's another week in the Foyer Reference household and it is not a serious opener, but it is just as splooshy. This cold open is dedicated to Brian Tyree Henry. <laughs> I would have said we covered the Eternals, but that was on the patron feed. Mm. And also ridiculous Brad Pitt. We love him. But get out of here. We're talking about Brian Tyree Henry. Let's get on with the show. Friends and locomotive lovers, welcome back to the Foyer Reference Podcast. You got your host, Katie. And Oti. Lean into the frivolity through fun dialogue, character backstory, and getting emotional over fruits and unnamed locomotives. <laughs> choo choo! Hop aboard and enjoy the ride with Bullet Train this week. Whoa. We ride at dawn, motherfuckers. <laughs> I'm having a lot of fun. Clearly. Ooh, ooh, ooh. Spoiler, spoiler, spoiler. Vitamin C, vitamin C, vitamin C. Are you all vitamins up, young blood? Sure, bro. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, let's get into general stats and information. This film is, I guess you could call an adaptation, a book that we need to add to our reading list, perhaps friends and lovers, uh, Maria Beadle by Katara Ishaka in regards to director, uh, Jonathan Wickenston is coming out soon. Make sure you go and check out our episode on Jonathan Wickenston. Uh, we have director David Leach in regards to writers. We have Zach Olkowitz. It was released in August of 2022 and oh, uh, released by Sony. Sorry, I'm, I'm getting excited. I really, w- I'm going to break the uh, reference curtain right now. I really wish we watched this in cinemas. Me too. I'm big Mads fan <laughs> because I have a lot of time for Brian Tyree Henry. The same thing with Confess Fletch. Like, yes, I do love John Hamm, but Roy Wood Jr. was my pull. Wow. Just like I'm not here for Brad Pitt, I'm here for Brian Tyree Henry. Oh, man. And and are you sure I'm the one with the tax? Oh, come on. Have you ever seen? (laughs) No. How dare you? Have you ever seen a bad Brian Tyree Henry performance ever? No. No, but ever is such a small time span, though. Well, if I can play homage (laughs) to his great British accent, fuck off. Oh, wow. (laughs) (laughs) A budget of $85.9 million and a worldwide gross of $233 million OT. (laughs) That's a lot of Fiji waters. It is. And shouts to the, the, I guess, the nerds at Wikipedia, um, the open source internet of them all, because Fiji Water is credited as the cast. (laughs) (laughs) It got a backstory, bro. Bro, if that made you mad, like if Fiji Water getting a backstory made you mad, then you you need to shuffle off the 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 monotony and the mundane nature of being an adult and just have some fucking fun, man. <laughs> oh man, oh man. Uh, let me get through uh, a good chunk of the car so we can get to the show. Ot, there's something that I didn't even necessarily consider as a theme. Um, and I think it's going to surprise you. Oh, so I've got some themes I want to talk about, uh, but let me get to the cast. Brad Pitt, Fiji Water, Joey King, Aaron Taylor Johnson, Brian Tyree Henry, Andrew Koji, Hiroyuki Sanada. Go and check out our Mortal Kombat episode. Um, but they really did Sonata dirty. Like it was all about Scorpion. They didn't need to have, was it Cole Young? Mm. (laughs) Oh, man. Man, this really appealed to my sensibilities. Michael Shannon, mm-hmm. come on now. Benito A. Martinez Ocasio, otherwise known as Bad Bunny. Mm-hmm. Sandra Bullock. Mm-hmm. And also shout outs to our hero from Heroes. <laughs> Uh, Karen Fukuhara wasn't in the main section, but she obviously deserves a shout out and shout outs to the astute OT because in the boys, in all of our boys episodes, we do talk about how we want her to be casted with full dialogue. Give her a voice, bruv. Even in Suicide Squad. Let her speak. As Katana. Yeah. Yeah. It's too many. uh, Nah, nah, nah. Even here, she got a few role, a few dialogues in, but not enough. Not enough. Ooh, ooh, ooh. Man, 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 man. It's so nice to fucking enjoy something. Mm. Ooh, ooh, ooh. 
Let's get into first impressions, OT. I've already revealed that I've been splooshing all over this recording so far. How did you feel leading up to this? Um, and how did you feel throughout? And where do we find you now, my love? Didn't know anything about the movie, yeah. which I'm happy, you know, because you're telling me, oh, Brian Terry Henry has a new movie. Like, cool, cool. We'll, we'll get to see it once it's out. And then I think with a sort of, he told me that they're sort of bad reviews about the movie. They're like, yeah, we're not going to go watch it in the cinema because we've had a lot of dads in the cinema. Man, I was really just going to ride positivity today, but you go yeah, no, off, no, no, King. No. Like, I, I was, I was, I was not prepared to enjoy this movie. Man. Halfway through, I was like, okay, maybe it's going to drop its shoe somewhere here because. Yeah. Where is oh, the bad bit coming? Is it, is it Jezebel? And we do love Sarah Snook, but man, that really, really took a turn, that film. <laughs> and also, <It> did. <laughs> um, what's that Rebecca Hall film with Tim Roth? Resurrection. Resurrection. That took a turn as well. But anyway, you continue. Yeah, so I was expecting it to just sort of just do something that will take me out of the movie and not enjoy it as much. Uh-huh. But it did not. Man, engage the whole time. Yeah, I, I loved it. Hop aboard the mugging train. I love the characters, apart from sort of Joy King's character, where I was a bit... Uh, she wasn't necessary. Yeah, but everyone else, fucking amazing. <laughs> <laughs> I just loved it. I, I love the ridiculousness. You could tell that... David Leach was all over in this. You know, uh-huh. you could feel the Jonathan Wickens turn up in here. Yeah. And I was there for it. I the think, action was a lot of yeah, fun. Yeah. I think, you know, when, when we've sort of watched a lot of the directors that we don't really vibe, we we tend to not know sort of, oh, this movie isn't that great because, hey, this director has these tendencies or whatnot. But man, I don't think he can do any wrong. Okay. And Chad Stahelski? Mm-hmm. Oh, man. Wow, 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 wow. You know, friends and lovers. And uh, we are going to come to a particular theme. However, I did say um, after watching it, you know, it's nice to enjoy something without the race politics. And I'm putting the biggest ass fucking asterisk on that. <laughs> um, I am, I am eating, I am eating my kumbaya words. Apparently. I can see you trembling saying that. <laughs> um, but anyway, so so my first impressions, I absolutely agree with you. I had so much fucking fun with this film, and I, I think it's very similar to like the new Suicide Squad film um i i don't think there's a lot in the market for adult entertainment in way of like not just vulgarity but like mature themes and also straight up fucking ridiculousness mm-hmm. right i think um for for people that watch a lot of like straight lace shit like maybe this tonally wouldn't make a lot of sense we're fucking sweaty weebs in the corner <laughs> With our Kamiko pillows, like <laughs> <laughs> I think I would say for people that really enjoyed it, or or maybe maybe like d- opposite. I, th- I think people that didn't enjoy it probably don't get into like anime. They probably don't get down with anime, or they probably or, just or better yet, yes, just pull that stick out of your bum. <laughs> <laughs> OT, the seventh bum door of the world, am I right? Uh-huh. <laughs> Go and check out our in betweeners episode, uh, friends and lovers, just while we're here. Um, but I would say if people didn't enjoy it, I wouldn't be surprised if they don't enjoy anime. Mm. Um, and I think tonally, it fucking worked. Like this fucking appealed to me so much. There was something, and if we're talking about like the aesthetics as well, there was something reminiscent of Pulp Fiction to me. Okay. I think just getting to learn the characters and, you know, like um, <laughs> I feel like the only time I mentioned Tarantino is when he's talking about the N-word or his portrayal of black characters. But one of the things he does really well is like mundane sort of dialogue, mm. right? And we definitely saw that between Lemon and Tangerine. Um, and no, I'm not just saying it because you have a black character and a white character, um, <laughs> the Vincent Vega of it all. Um, but I, I really enjoyed stylistically 
Definitely, it was a lot of fun. Um, the the dialogue was a lot of fun. The character backstories, like the moment the snake got a backstory, we well, to be fair, we were already in, but I think we absolutely we lost ourselves and ascended to heaven. <laughs> I remember shouting at you, bro. How we seeing a snake backstory? And I was here? like, what the fuck? And then we got it, <laughs> and we got it, and man, this was a lot of fun. Like it's, I I do say it all the time. Like it's just not for me. I'm not going to sit here and say it should be this, it should be that. But man, this was an out of the box plug and play into all of my pussy valley. Like this was fucking ace. I fucking love this film. Me too. I think when only the dialogue worked, we know that his action scenes are quite tight. So that's Mm -hmm. a given, but giving us multiple characters you care for. Yeah. It's, 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 it's not a, it sounds simple, but it's fucking difficult. Man, I cry. I cried over Thomas the Tank Engine, and I cried over citrus fruits. <laughs> like I just, oh, it was so much fun. Okay, let's get into the themes. I've called this one "Pain Trains and All the Feels." Okay. So I want to talk about the not necessarily like a murder mystery, but how do you feel about genre films like centered around a train? You know, I already referenced go and check out our Demon Slay uh episode, you weeb players. Um and also like Murder on the Orient Express. We did read the book, Friends and Lovers, but we watched the recent film and we de- we decided not to cover it. So, you know, go and check out our Demon Slayer episode, you nasty weebs. Um, but you have the Mug and Train arc. Um, we have Murder on the Orient Express as well as Train to Busan. Mm. Yeah, it's something that doesn't really work that well, at least for all the train movies that I've watched. You know, well, from, Train to Busan was good, but it wasn't solely on a train. Yeah, it wasn't yeah. solely on a train. Like, I'm thinking Taking of Pelham 1, 2, 3 or some shit like that. It was fine. Mud on the Orient Express tried to play too much of the angles, and it fucking infuriated me. The overhead, right? Yeah. Uh, but this, you know, it, it just worked with its simplicity. He didn't try to be too complex. He didn't try to be too... Ooh, I'm going to give you some fucking angles from, you know, Drone Z. Yeah. It's simplicity just carried it through without uh-huh. you know, without any distractions. You could focus on everything else that's happening. You know, you, you could focus on the dialogue quite nicely, which was fucking amazing. I think this is one of my favorite train-based movies to date. Okay, letterbox list, man. <laughs> Okay, I, I I don't necessarily even have a mental list. Um, Simon Baker, how's he going? Man, I thought he'd be in more by now. Okay, um, let me find your subreddit post about Simon Baker, OT. <laughs> <laughs> um, I, I don't go out of my way to think about uh, narrative centering trains. However, I do feel like it was core to the film. Um, so it did feel important and it did feel necessary, um, that, you know, it wasn't necessarily on a different sort of vessel of transportation. Um, I I thought it was a lot of fun, you know, even, um, when you had Ladybug, Brad Pitt's character, um, you know, even when he did his MacGyver shit with the golf club and that sort of thing, like it it was all very specific to the setting that they were in, which I thought was a lot of fun. Um, Even like the one minute uh, friends and lovers that are in or have been to Japan um, would love to know more about bullet trains and if they literally only give you a minute. I've heard stories of like guards or, you know, staff pushing people onto the train. Uh, Let's move on. On to the next light theme are uh, films that are filled with celeb cameos. Usually they don't work, mm. but it fucking worked here. Why? Because I'm thinking like Valentine's Day. I'm thinking movie 43. Yes. <laughs> Love Actually or The Lesser Man's The Holiday. <laughs> <laughs> That's wow. that's the one if you if you were late to Blockbuster, that's the one that you would have to rent instead of Love Actually. <laughs> <laughs> and then New Year's Eve, you know, there there are lots of films where you're just like stuffing all of the celebs in all of the orifices, Gwyneth Paltrow, group or otherwise. Um, so why do you think it worked here? Because they chose such a solid ensemble, the main cast, that uh, 
every other cameo didn't feel like a distraction. Okay. I say usually when you get a lot of those sort of cameos, it's more of, oh, the story's gonna be shit. So I'll just give you faces that you already know and you'll freak out over that. Yeah, it's kind of like a, 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 a like a dance number. It's the equivalent of Krieger's smoke bomb. <laughs> Absolutely. You're, you're right. Cause it kind of like evens out the Justin Bieber effect and all of that. Right. Mm-hmm. I think it's also because, you know, like a list or otherwise, all of the characters were serving the story. Yep. So they all made sense. Even Ryan Reynolds, I guess you could say. Yeah. Um, I did try and plug in some relevant movie news one time before when I talked about Lady Gaga in Joker 2 and you really didn't care for it and just ignored me. But I'm going to try and do another relevant movie news to you now. How do you feel about Ryan Reynolds coming back in Deadpool and also potentially Hugh Jackman coming back as Wolverine in that Deadpool film? Thoughts? Feelings? Good. I love Deadpool. What's not to love about it? Okay. Yeah, and Wolverine. What's not to love about him? All right. I, I was waiting for a hotep hotep. Nah, no hoteps here. Um, in it, Deadpool is one of those sort of, it doesn't take itself too seriously. And you know, I love those sort of movies. So give me more Deadpool. Give me more Wolverine. Okay. I will give you more Deadpool and I will give you more Wolverine. You know why? Mm. Because our next theme is representation of race and casting. Wow. Yay, 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 yay. Okay, so do you want to share your thoughts first or do you want me to read you some quotes? Give me the quotes. Okay. Um, I will I will do a callback from a couple of minutes ago when I said I love that I was able to enjoy Bullet Train without thinking about, like, race politics. Mm-hmm. I said that after watching Bullet Train and then, um, you know, doing some light research um, in the lead up to this recording, um, I stumbled across, you know, some controversy and some, some well, some well earned criticism of bullet train. Okay. But the waters be murky OT. All right. Color me intrigued. All right. Color me bad. (laughs) We're of the culture friends and lovers. Uh, okay. So, so just as a general sort of gist, um, there was backlash, particularly from like the Asian American community, um, about the fact that it, unless you looked at the inv- individual character posters, you wouldn't even know that this was a, a film that was set in Tokyo. Unless, unless you were looking at the individual character posters for the film, you wouldn't even know that there's Asian characters in this film because they're all kind of secondary characters. If you think about Karen Fukuhara's character, if you think about Miso, our hero from Heroes, he was also in the background as well. It was very uh, white top heavy, (laughs) this film. (laughs) (laughs) <laughs> and I'm not just talking about Michael Shannon's. Um, <laughs> Bro, um, we've we've gone from <laughs> Adam Driver, Andre Siler, now Michael Shannon. I don't have a fucking type, right? <laughs> Clearly not. <laughs> <laughs> and we still haven't covered Morris Chestnut, but that's a story for another day. I have thoughts. I have things I want to say, um, but I'm just going to read the quotes that we have available. I want to get your thoughts and then I'll share my thoughts. Yeah. Yeah. Are I'm you ready? Yeah, I'm ready. Okay. So this is, this is Joey King and this is a quote that she made. She, keep in mind she's in the film. <laughs> Okay. I do not believe a white woman should play a character of color, not me or any other white woman for that matter. Okay. Um I agree with the sentiment, but then <laughs> Yeah, do you want me to just keep reading? Yeah, keep okay. reading. So keep in mind, um, Isaka is the author of the book Mm. that this film was adapted from. So when asked about the casting, Isaka defended the film and described his characters as ethnically malleable. (laughs) What the fuck does that mean? Maintaining that his original Japanese setting and context were irrelevant as they were, in quotes, not real people. Maybe they're not even Japanese. Oh, come on. It stinks. <laughs> okay. It stinks. <laughs> if you ever wanted to know what, I'm not going to say selling out, but wow. Oh, bruh. <laughs> 
I look I look forward to your your book about adventures in Kenya and saying the same thing, OT. Mm-hmm. We'll just see how much money will get you to bend that dollar. Yeah, it doesn't fall. It doesn't jiggle, mate. It folds. Wow! Wow! <laughs> OT keeps up with um, OG hip hop friends and lovers. <laughs> Uh, a, a couple of other quick ones. Um, the Sony group president highlighted Osaka's views and defended it, um, saying that it would still have the Japanese soul while giving opportunity to cast big names and adapt it on a global scale. Okay. I feel like you're losing your Japanese soul as I continue. <laughs> I have one more. I have one more. I have one more. Uh, the screenwriter, Zach, argued that the decision to cast beyond Japanese or Asian actors proved the strength of Isaka's work as it is a story that could transcend race. I don't know. We watched Cloud Atlas and we saw how transcending race did. <laughs> love the Wachowskis. And out of love for the Wachowskis, I will give Cloud Atlas another go. But we saw what transcending race looked like. Mm-hmm. And it looked like Chet Hanks. <laughs> Boomba class. <laughs> <laughs> Okay, okay. So we've heard a lot. Um, and then there was also a, a, an Asian American critic um that was talking about it, um, saying that, you know, it's it, it's not cool because even when it's a story about Asian people, they're in the background, right? Yeah, I see that. And also there was a, like an executive sort of sentiment saying um, you know, in an Asian market, they're so used to seeing only Asian people. So they're quite interested because they love Holly- Hollywood films. They would be very interested. <laughs> <laughs> Wait, let me finish. They would be very interested to see foreigners instead of Asians. <laughs> okay, this turned into a South Park episode, but thoughts. <laughs> Give me your thoughts because I also have thoughts I want to um, sploosh all over you. Bruh, I knew, I knew there had to be something when I, you only said, oh, it's, 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 it doesn't have any political <laughs> <laughs> no, I, I said I said put an asterisk on it. And I'm gonna come back to it. All right. Um Wow, okay. Uh first Joey King saying oh characters should be, you know, should be comfortable playing different race sort of characters. It's giving Emma Stone trying to play a Hawaiian. Yeah. It's giving Scarlett Johansson trying to play a tree. Yeah, like uh, I'm not sure. Then again, I agree with the sentiment in terms of how, you know, not, what? no, like she oh, said, what she said, yeah, what but she not says. her action. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. All right. All right. Cool. Now to the writer. I, I don't think that's fair to say. Do you mean the author of the book? Yeah. Okay. Him saying that it's not necessarily, um, they're not necessarily even Japanese, even Stand if they're by in, it. Like just. Come that's on, like, man. That's like if George R. R. Martin said, oh, no, they don't have to be related in this sex scene. No, it is very clear the the thing that gets you off is the fact that they're incestuous. Yeah, we, we actually need to look into that guy for a bit, you know, just Keep see. the nieces away from you. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, like, stand by your fucking walk. It's based in fucking Japan. Could Don't- you imagine if they put uh, like 80% white people in pachinko? Oh man, I would riot. Oh, pachinko, it's not necessarily based on Korean people. Ha ha ha. Actually, now that we're talking about it, you know what this becomes? Mm. Prey. It does become prey. I, I love, I love that they, you know, in regards to native representation. However, I feel like in the 2020s, it's time to go full Comanche sub and dub. Mm. Um, so it's like, let's do it. Like, let's go all the way. And then like all of the characters were speaking English, but they didn't understand each other. You know what I mean? Like, let's get to a point where we can get to the point. Yeah. And it's one of those things when Parasite won the award and people are like, oh, we need to make a US version of Parasite. No, you fucking don't. But see, this is where I have qualm and this is why I'm adjacent into the bong hive with my little table outside of the official hive. Mm. But Bong Joon-ho would have signed that off. I know, which is... It's not like some British museum black market off-selling of his IP. But at the end of the day, you want him to make his money and also for the world to be open to... You know you know what that also means? Mm. That the rights to old boy was also willingly sold. Yeah, of course. Jesus. You know, <laughs> they're not lion-kinging it. They're not... 
doing Kimba all over again with this. They're buying the IPs or trying to, you know, so they can recreate them in their own fucking Western way and ruin something, most of the time. Something that I really enjoyed about Bullet Train as well. I was like, because uh, when you have, well, to be fair, we didn't know Joey King was going to play a British person or Brian Tyree Henry. Like I just, sometimes when you have like a lot of Americans in a non-American context, the whole story is about them experiencing non-American things. And mm. I was like, uh, but then I'm glad that this film wasn't that. Right, albeit too, the yeah. albeit the American invasion that happened, um, <laughs> but yeah. So, any other general thoughts in regards to the race? Like, did you even think of that watching the film? I did, but I pushed it back to my mind. Okay, so that I could watch just, the backstory of the Fiji water. Yeah, I get the disappointment in not in not having Asian characters at the forefront for this. You know, we only had like Kimura and the Elder, yeah. and that wasn't really. Like, it, it was like, bruh, more characters could have been Asian. Oh, yeah, absolutely. You know? I think it was also, um, you know, if we want to talk about, like, Jodie Turner-Smith um, with Anne Boleyn and that sort of thing, like, I think because they casted other diverse actors, maybe it was easier to ignore the fact that Asians weren't at the forefront of this film. Um but my general thoughts. So I kind of expected it, to be honest. Like I saw, I saw Brad Pitt, I saw Joey King and they were talking for, and they were ha- taking a lot of screen time. And I'm like, okay, we're going to have a top heavy white cast in this. Right. Mm. I knew it was based on a, a book from Japan. I knew it was going to be set in Japan. Um, but I kind of expected it, you know, um, being on this podcast, covering a lot of films, obviously Tarantino company included, like I knew this was going to happen. And, you know, I get mad about the White Lotus, but it's like Hollywood gone to Hollywood, I suppose. So I was kind of already expecting that. So when I say I was surprised that I wasn't, um, like I didn't experience any sort of race politics. It was more in the sense of the themes that were covered in this film weren't necessarily in regards to that. Um, I, yeah, you're right. You, there was no way you couldn't notice that <laughs> like most of the characters we're focusing on are white uh, or at least a lot of them aren't Asian mm. as main characters, main, main characters. And then even when you get near the end of the film and you have Hiroyuki Sonata or maybe he's just got a really high fee charge because it's like, why didn't we get that the whole fucking film? Yeah. Right. Um, but anyway, so there was no way to ignore it, but at the same time, like I, I just assumed they were going to expect us as an audience to just be like, Oh, it's an international city. You know, that's why we've got all these international people. You know what I mean? Mm. Yeah. And I, and I did get that. Uh, I think because we had, or oh, for for my perspective, seeing Zazi and Brian, I was like, "Oh, cool! You do you, man." <laughs> <laughs> but that's your tax. Yeah, that's I'm my sure tax. I'm sure if we were to talk to Asian people, or maybe if you catch me in AAPI month, I would I would speak a lot differently about this film. Yeah, but they had such small role, well, apart from Brian, maybe. But but he even he, he didn't even get that much sort of screen time. But. We had like more main characters that, you know, it could have probably gone to an Asian person. Not probably. It could have. Yeah, it could have. Crazy Rich Asians proves at the box office it's going to sell. And and my friends and lovers, please send me your address so we can sign the petition for Ronnie Cheng to be Shang-Chi and Shang-Chi 2. And I think the sentiment of, oh, where the Sony president was like, oh, we're doing it so we can get more attention to the film or make it more international. Things like Parasite, Crazy Rich Asians goes to show you that it doesn't fucking need to, Mm -hmm. you know, Um, the audience is, has fucking grown from the days of fucking King Kong. Oh, you know, so we are mature enough to to appreciate content as it is. Uh huh. And anyone who isn't, they need to do the fucking work. Yeah. So let's 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 create for what what we see the industry to be, rather than what is currently trying to be like holding on to the fucking bottom of the barrel sort of people who are like, oh, if it's subtitles, I'm not gonna watch it. What the fuck? Friends and lovers, uh, for your reference, is a place of learning 
and it is a place of growth. And OT, I'm going to ask the hard 60-minute question. Bring it. We talk this big man shit about representation, but we also fucking enjoyed this film. So aren't we the fucking problem? I think there two we can look at it from two angles. A <laughs> <laughs> I didn't technically cheat, baby. I didn't. <laughs> Over the clothes stuff doesn't count. <laughs> <laughs> Over the close sibling loving is fine. <laughs> oh wow. Okay. Uh well, now I feel bad for enjoying it, but I think I think everyone feels bad about sibling loving. Eh, you'll be surprised not everyone. <laughs> <laughs> I think there's an aspect of okay, we can enjoy it for what it fucking is from a, you know, base level and also still ask the hard hitting questions at the end of it. Well, we love Godfather. Yeah, so we're not resting on our laurels and being like, "Hey, we demand more." Yeah. Even though I enjoyed it, it can be better. Yeah. And you can do better as well. Well, that was very pointed in saying you can do better. <laughs> You also can do better, OT. <laughs> okay, that's enough. That's enough of that seriousness. Let's get back into the nonsense and the frivolity. Which character do you want to start with? Lemon and Tangerine. Right? They kind of made the film for me. And I will say, you know, in a lot of films, when it's mentioned more than three times, it gets annoying. But I, like, I enjoyed it every time. I was worried every time it was mentioned whether it was going to bother me. But I feel like with with less, with less a lesser actor, it would have been fucking annoying. But Brian Tyree Henry just has a fucking endearing nature that I just love. He just, he does it so well. To be honest with you, uh oh, the moment I thought they overdoing it a bit. Not that I did. Like I, I got the sentiment and I enjoyed it, but I felt like we could you, we could have used less of that for a bit. Just, okay, just a little sort of you know. Let's do better in this regard as well. Uh-huh. <laughs> but yeah, um, they definitely made this. They those super. You could tell the chemistry between those two. Yeah was great i think i loved seeing them back and forth and even even the backstory was super emotional you know and i just i could not take myself away from not loving these characters or even being invested in their sort of success up until the end Uh you know and they're sort of Romeo and Juliet moment where where Tangerine thinks that Lemon's dead, you know, and then he dies, and we get Lemon waking up later. Yeah, man, that was that was sad. They re- they Romeo and Julieted them. Mm-hmm. They were a lot of fun. I really enjoyed it. Well, since you said that, um, it got annoying. So you think the Thomas and the Tank Engine thing was too annoying? Not too annoying. I think it was funny at some points, but I think. <sighs> The aspects or moments, I can't remember the specific scene, but those are the specific scene. I was like, yeah, you, you don't need to bring this up right now. Because I think in the, within the first five minutes of meeting Lemon and Tangerine, they mentioned it so many times. Uh, I was like, okay, I get it. Let's let's use it with other people. Let's uh-huh. use it differently. Yeah. But um, yeah, but that's such a small qualm compared to what was de- delivered. I would also say like um, with lesser acting, it would have gotten annoying and it would have been one dimensional because it's like, ha ha, guy you wouldn't expect enjoying Thomas the Tank Engine. Like that would great on me. But again, like in, in my heart, in my mind, even including Eternals, Brian Tyree Henry can do no wrong. Yeah, but you know what rescued the usage of that for me at least? Uh-huh. Where I... I, I initially thought it was getting a bit too overused was when tangerine notices the diesel sticker on joey king pop goes the diesel and i was like fuck yeah this this right here is what i need because everyone was fucking buying into joey king's tears and whatnot and these are all trained assassins yeah and if everyone is off the train why is she still there you know Mm. what i mean Absolutely. And yeah, definitely. Um, I absolutely agree with you. I, yeah, obviously I'm just going to love all over Brian Tyree Henry. Um, Lemon was a lot of fun. Like them, you know, the, the cutbacks, I, I can, I personally don't see it, but I could understand why people might get annoyed with the back and forths. Like
like even when they were trying to figure out whether it was 16 kills or 17 kills i mm. enjoyed it like i think it worked but i think you kind of need to be bought into this film which i guess you could say is a lot of it it's you know the wachowski effect go and check out our matrix episode um friends and lovers like you need to buy into the premise to be able to in some cases you can still watch a film and enjoy it but this one you had to actually buy in otherwise it's just too ridiculous and you know um if i may quote woodhouse tripping balls (laughs) i want to talk about the wolf we haven't really mentioned anything about bad bunny i kind of like the idea of like getting rappers or even since we're in the spooky october season shout outs to kelly Rowland and friends of lovers if you didn't know we have a freddy versus jason episode um we talk about (laughs) kelly taking one for the team (laughs) (laughs) um it was nice seeing bad bunny like i i really enjoyed watching him act in this um it felt very effortless like he he fit in with the rest of the ensemble especially because we're talking about how stacked the cast was um and even uh raising canaan with joey badass like i really enjoy seeing musicians um in screen and you know i guess while we're talking about musicians in screen um brian tyree henry like his character lemon getting all the way to the end reminded me of LL Cool J's character in Deep Blue Sea. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> the car was his crucifix. <laughs> um but yeah i i really enjoyed the wolf's uh character um he just did he just did not have like any chance of happiness. Mhm. But I think if he spent two minutes to look at the envelope he had, he'd know that he'd notice that Brad Pitt wasn't the killer and it was Zazie. Unless he thought he was looking at Morpheus and it's whatever you think you see. <laughs> Go and check out our Sandman episode, friends and lovers. Um, I thought it was fun. Like, obviously, he didn't have a great childhood. He didn't even get to enjoy his wedding day. Um, you know, it probably would have been more fun to be at Louis and Jerome's wedding in Snowfall. <laughs> That's probably the better way to get spiked um, at a wedding. Um, but it was really, I really enjoyed having him there. I thought he added to the film. Um, and, yeah, he definitely stacked up to the rest of the cast. Oh, for sure. Yuchi was pretty useless, if I can be honest, Mm. which is frustrating because he's one of the few Asian characters that, first of all, that are few, but also that get screen time. He probably got the most screen time. Yeah, he got definitely got the most screen time and he did the least because half of it, he was incapacitated in the bathroom. At the other half, he was pretty much a prince's Colin Wim. And and also, like, the elder is your father, like, fully trained, muscle memory, probably even with both eyes closed, ten toes down could knock you out, right? You're you're the son of him. And also, it was identified that he worked for the White Death, yep. unless he was, like, a serial figures accountant. But in any case, I don't understand how he didn't have any sort of combatant skill. <laughs> he did, because at quite at the end, we see, get to see him use his spear a bit, you know? Oh, finally for stab, fucking stab, once. Stab, stab, <laughs> stab. Chucky does a lot more. Yeah, my qualm was, why not text your dad? Why not ask mm. your dad, hey, protect my kid. Yeah. I'm going for revenge. To be fair, he did protect the grandson anyway. Yeah, but if he knew that the, uh, that the elder was looking after the grandson, he would have no problem dealing with the prince. But I think it remains to be seen whether he had the cojones or skills to be able to do that. It was kind of like Mother's Milk being like, yeah, team. (laughs) Go, man. I think it would have been easy to deal with the prince unless she is injecting V into herself. I don't think she would have been a problem. Wow. We're mixing worlds, hey? We are. The compound V train. (laughs) Choo-choo. That seems like a deep uh, commercial. It does, doesn't it? Well, let's talk about the older. Um... Were you surprised at at the tie-in for the film? No, made sense. Made sense. And it wasn't one of those like, gotcha. It was just like, oh yeah, cool. Exactly. It it didn't feel like an ex machina throwing something in there that we're like, oh, come on, bruv now. Mm. It made sense. We're like, okay, cool. You're here. I think you could have communicated better with your son (laughs) outside of that. I think he was one of the best characters in this. Yeah. Oh, abs- oh, oh, yes, absolutely. Mm. 
and I don't, it's interesting. And may, maybe in another format at a different time, because the thought of watching that Matt Damon, Great Wall of China film, I have no interest in. <laughs> I have no interest in seeing Tom Cruise be a samurai. Like, I feel like those are more egregious, but maybe that's because you're physically inserting white people into like figures in Asian history. Maybe that's why. Mm. Right. Yeah. I, I see that. Well, I think with everything that's been raised, I think it's not for us to say, oh, it's okay. I think if if Asian people are like, bro, this ain't cool. Look it ain't you, cool. OT, doing the work. Yeah, I've done the work, man. Like I'm, I'm almost ascending. Well, I think I'm descending because I feel like I'm gonna, I feel like I'm gonna refer to many people as the white death now. Wow. <laughs> <laughs> well, we talked about it. They they used the like you know the word black in a lot of things like black winter and you know all that sort of stuff. So it's nice to have some equal representation. <laughs> Just because you know it's 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 all um it's all ethnically malleable. Mm-hmm. <laughs> what did you think about the big reveal? I like in my head, cause you know, they always have that and friends and lovers very deep into, uh, Pamela's paninis. We did cover the hunt shout outs and we love Betty Gilpin, but there was a particular reveal and I'm not going to, in case you want to give yourself some sort of joy and surprise in life. Um, but there was a reveal in the hunt, which right so sometimes when you build up a reveal it's not worth it but i really enjoyed seeing michael shannon oh i thought you i thought you were talking about sandra bullock being the reveal oh <laughs> no michael shannon is is definitely um was a is, she, is she your white death <laughs> yeah <laughs> yeah it was really good seeing him um he's one of those people that just brings a smile to your face oh absolutely mm. um Speak your smile to our face. Zazie Beats, uh, go and check out our Joker episode, uh, Friends and Lovers, as the Hornet. Yeah, she's a Joker in this, isn't she? Really? She deals in poisoning everyone Mm -hmm. and has only one antidote. Come on now. Yeah. She deserved to die that fucking death, mate. Wow. (laughs) Just for that alone. You're not rooting for everyone, Black, eh? (laughs) Ah! Like, how how stupid can you be? I've... I'm here poisoning everyone and I only have one jab. Man, even with COVID, we're taking fucking four jabs. Okay. Do more, man. Do produce more. You know, if, if you've watched Family Business, Orlando will not have let us slide. I think you've got too many 5Gs. Maybe you injected too much OT. <laughs> <laughs> Why are you mad? Why are you fighting? I'm just saying, it was ridiculous. Ooh, I wasn't expecting it to get spicy, but I guess that's our Scoville level, friends and lovers. <laughs> uh, is there anything else you want to say to wrap up the episode? No, I, I enjoyed it, but we can also accept that we need to do the work and let Asian people play Asian characters. Nice. And let's it simulu. Otherwise, I want Ronnie Chang instead in Shang-Chi. <laughs> Sign my petition, OT. Mm-hmm. We're going to finish off in a segment we call For Your Reference, OT. I'm going to reference John Wick. Ooh. Enjoy it. Like, you won't be disappointed. All right. And I'm going to reference Train to Busan. Nice. But not Peninsula. If you'd like to see OT's Peninsulas on Twitter and Instagram, we're at For Your F Pod. Write us an email at hellofrapodcast.com. We're also on, I've said it before and I'll say it again, Let People Write Their Own Fucking Stories podcast so you can leave a rating and review. And we'll see you guys next week. See ya. Bye.